All right. Um, today I'm here with three-time Pro Bowl, 2007 first-team All-Pro, NFC champion, former Seahawks linebacker Lofa Tatupu. How you doing? What's happening, brother? All right. So I got 11 questions. I came up with myself. So let's just get right into them. I don't want to waste too much of your time. All good, my man. All good. All right. So you were drafted in 2005. It's spent the first three years of your career with Mike Holmgren as your coach, and then the fourth with Jim Mora. What was it like hearing that your former coach at USC was going to become your head coach in the NFL? Um, it was wild. I thought Pete would never, you know, with all the success we had at SC, <clears throat> he had, I mean, what, eight or nine straight pack championships, uh, two titles that we won, you know, together down there in 03 and 04. But then another appearance in 05. I didn't think he was ever getting, no one was ever getting Pete out of, you know, Southern Cal. I didn't think anyways. So it was cool. And you knew, um, you know, I didn't know that John was going to be coming too, though. And, you know, with because Green Bay has hit on so many picks over there that I think it's really the fact that both of them, it, it worked out to be like a perfect marriage, man. I mean, they, you see every draft class that they bring in is at least two or three guys that are, are just, all pros, you know, some even potential Hall of Famers these days. Yeah, they're, they're really great at hitting on late round picks. Like you go back and you see guys like Chris Carson, David Moore, guys like that, seventh round picks who turn out to be stars in the Chancellor. offense. Yeah, Sherm yeah. Chancellor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they've done a great job. And I mean, you know, that's, you know, Pete did a great job at SC recruiting. And then, um, you know, John with all the picks that, you know, he was responsible for on that staff in Green Bay. Uh, it's been incredible, and um, there's going to be a lot of names going up in that ring of honor in the next, uh, you know, five to ten years or so. Yeah, seriously, this team right now, we got in the past 2013 team, you're going to see a lot of those guys. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, was there any relevance to you picking the number 51? You know, it's a funny story. I'll try to make it short, but – when I got drafted, they called me up and they're like, hey, what number do you want? And so I go, yo, let me get 58. I wore that in college. Let me just carry it on. They're like, nah, Isaiah casavetsky has got 58. You know, he's a six-year veteran. You're not getting it. I was, okay, let me get um, – next, I think I wanted to go with 55. 55 was the big number at SC, you know, all the greats. Willie Mack, uh, Chris Claiborne, Junior Seau. They all, you know, my boy Keith Rivers, all the greats wore 55 at SC. So that was, that was a big number. So I go, let me get that. They go, nah, Jamie Sharper, we just signed him to a big deal. He's got 55. So then I'm going down the list. I must have done that two or three times. And so I finally got tired of it. I go, yo, just give me a number already. <laughs> and so um, the last number they said, they go, well, you got a choice, 56 and 51. And I go, all right, give me 56. And, you know, loved watching Lawrence Taylor when I was a kid. And they're like, well, we're going to give you 51. And, the, and, you know, the coaches have a reason for it. And I was like, this could have been a five-second conversation instead of a five-minute conversation if you just gave me 51. But the significance of 51, it does hold a, you know, a special place in my heart. My uncle, who lived with us growing up, um, he wore 51. He was my idol. I love him, you know, be like him in baseball, basketball, football, everything. And then... When I got to college, um, the great Ken Norton Jr. was my coach, and he wore 51, you know, five-time Pro Bowler, three-time straight Super Bowl champion, another championship as a coach, um, and he's been a, like a father figure and a mentor to me, and he, you know, he rocked that number, so it was it was meant to be. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I didn't know there was a full story like that for most, most of the players. You look at it, and they have those all those stories with the jersey number picking. Yeah, it was crazy. We had three linebackers that year, me, Leroy, and Cornelius Wortham from Alabama. And they got the numbers they wanted, and they just gave me a number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, whatever, man. I'll make it yeah. work. <laughs> All right. Um, as a kid who dreams of going to the NFL, what advice do you get for staying motivated and improving your game? You know, I can give you advice for improving your game. But staying motivated, it, you know, if you either you either love this or you don't. Like anything, and anybody that makes it in any industry or any job that they're in, if you don't have a clear vision of, you know, what you want it to look like, it's going to be a hard, you know. I guess in terms of motivation, I'll say this: don't listen to anybody else. If you want it, 
if you want it bad enough, it's going to happen. And don't listen to anybody else. Cause I got told, you know, all the time, like, Hey, you know, you're not that big. You're not that fast. Um, you're not that good. Even I've got told that. And I just kept working because I loved it. And, um, you know, it paid off. And then, um, so what was the second part? That was the motivation. What was the second part of that question? Um, improving your game. Improving your game. The more football you watch, the better you're going to get. I mean, even turning the volume on with the announcers, even though I know some of them are dreadful to listen to, uh, you're going to hear, you know, a lot of the quarterback analysts when I was growing up, they, it was all quarterbacks and they were teaching what the quarterback looks for, how they go through their progressions, where they're trying to attack. And I mean, as a defender, that helped me a lot in terms of learning what to look for on the opposite side of the ball. Um, but now, I mean, you got YouTube, you got Instagram, you got all these resources uh, called social media that, I mean, we didn't have that when I was a kid. That's how old I am, you know? Like the internet was barely <laughs> around back then. But if I had these, I would have been watching and studying everybody's game. And that's pretty much how I got better. When I got to college, I had access to film rooms and um, I broke down film. I watched all the grades, man, especially guys that were your, my size, you know? And, um, and from there, I just tried to add anything from their game into my game. And, and that's, that's how I got better. Yeah, I think I saw a video on YouTube of you like teaching how to cover um, like a outside receiver as a linebacker or something like that. Like yeah, man, video. It, yeah, it's all out there. And I mean, yeah. you know, technique and, you know, things have gotten even better since since then, you know. And so, um, yeah, take advantage of that because that's you have your own film vault. Guys are posting their highlights all the time and it's, uh, you know, watch how to make the play and then also watch where the defender or the offensive guy, you know, made the wrong move when they got beat, you know, because those it's not so much as what you do, but if you can study your opponent, once you perfect your game, then it's the game is that much easier. Yeah. I, I, I live in Jersey and I play football. And like when I was younger, I knew nothing about the game, but I was playing. And I said, I asked my coach, like, I'm, I'm really confused. He said, Sunday turn on the Giants game, turn on the Giants game. I was watching it. And then I, I learned so much from it. Just how to, you know, just how to do everything. Uh, what calls are, what, yeah. and I, ever since I've watched every Sunday. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, I was doing that since I was, so I was seven years old, man. I watched, you know, Saturday, I watched the, uh, the college game day. And then Sunday I watched, you know, NFL countdown and um, you know, it's, it's great. That's all, you know, knowledge that they're, they're passing on for free. Yeah. I really just started getting into college, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Right on, man. All right. Um, how did you deal with draft analysis saying you're too short to play linebacker in the NFL at a high level? I told them they couldn't see me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it's just something you, you know, you don't, it, draft analysts, that, that didn't concern me. But if I, you know, when I keep friends, because there's some coaching staffs that were saying, hey, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, get off blocks. And I was like, yo, just watch the tape. My, you know, my tape speaks for itself. I'm going to work hard to get better. But, um, you know, I just pointed to a lot of the guys that I looked up to, uh, which is, that's not a short joke right there. <laughs> uh, London Fletcher, uh, Dexter Coakley, Dat Wynn, uh, Zach Thomas. There, there were so many, uh, Al Wilson, so many 5'11", six-foot linebackers. And the thing is, you know, they worry about vision. But, you know, when you're, you got built-in leverage, we have – you know, stopping power. So when we hit a guy, they go backwards and, you know, because we're already lower than them, you know? So um, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to, to everything. And so I didn't, I never saw, you know, height as a determining factor in the success of a, you know, a player. Yeah. I remember I, I'm, you see, I'm, I made that highlight video and I saw this one play. It was the school back through the ball to, against the Redskins, so Jerome Bettis, and you just crushed him. He like went up, up and off the ground. It was awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that's when, when you're when – low man wins is what they yeah. say. You no, know, you got to get underneath and, and, and drive, your, drive your hips and drive your feet, and, you know. And it's, um, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Um, 
There are so many great games in your career. My personal favorite is a three-interception game versus the Philadelphia Eagles in 2007. Talk to us about that game and what you remember. You know what? It's, it's crazy. I don't – I mean, I remember the interceptions and everything, but when they told me – after, I guess, we went back and read the stat sheet, and they're like, well, you know, you had 13 solo tackles. I was – I was out of my element. I was in, I was in the zone and, you know, anybody that's been just in the zone and on fire, they, you know, you're totally immersed in the moment. It doesn't seem like all that's going on. And um, I just remember, so I came down with, it was, it was also, I, I torn my oblique the week before I wasn't, I wasn't about to play. And uh, then when I flew over there, I didn't practice all week. We flew over to Philly, like, 10 of us came down with the flu, like on Friday or Saturday. So we're all getting IVs all weekend. And, you know, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. They're like, oh, Lope's not going to play. And so we get out there. I dress up and go through the pre, you know, the warm up just to see if I can give it a go. Man, my, my, my side's killing me. Hurts even worse because I got the flu. And I look over in the corner and our pregame ritual, me, Leroy Hill, and Julian Peterson was to talk trash to the opposing teams. And, you know, I look over and I'm just missing out on all that fun because that's one of the most fun parts of playing on the road is, you know, it's a hostile environment. And so someone yells out, hey, Tatupu, you know, I can't, I can't repeat what they said, but they're like, you know, you're so soft, you're not even going to play. And I just walked over and I was like, that's it. I'm playing now. I go, I'm going to pick one off and I'm going to throw it, you know, to the 51 jersey right above you. And uh, he's like, whatever. So go into the... Uh, go into the locker room and um, I get a shot in the ribs, which did nothing. I was just, I was upset that I even took a shot because it hurt. Uh, took like a half a bottle of Dayquil and a Red Bull, two Red Bulls. And I went out there and I played the game of my life. That's what happened. <laughs> yes, no, I didn't even expect that. It's got 13 tackles and three interceptions. My coach, um, Zarek Rollins, he came up to me and, you know, usually – He's like, hey, you know, I need you to line everybody up, clear communication. Like, he gives me the little pep talk that he always did since I was a rookie. And so he comes up to me, and he's just – he didn't say anything. And so I'm like, what's up? And he's like, I know you're tired, I know you're hurt, and I know you're sick. I'm expecting the Michael Jordan flu game out of you. <laughs> and so I was like, Coach, I'm going to give you everything I got. Uh, and, you know, as as – Fate would have it. The first play, I came out and picked it off. And um, from there, it just, you know, I, I was in my element. I was in the zone, man. Yeah, the, the Michael Jordan flu game as a football player. That's, yeah. It was, uh, it was wild, man. I wasn't wasn't even supposed to play that game. Yeah, it's nice to just not, not even going into it, not even expecting the play, and then you just have the game of your life. So I tried to – I don't want to make this too long. I tried to talk to Holmgren after because Holmgren said, hey, man, that was, you know, a great game. And I go, coach, well, you know, I didn't practice all week, so maybe that's the secret. I don't need practice anymore. And he goes, to hell with that. You're practicing on Tuesday. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, I tried. I tried. <laughs> Any attempt to get out of practice. Practice? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, what role does football play in your life right now? Oh, good question. Um, you know, right now, just a fan. I'm just a fan of the game. I mean, I love the game. I watch any and every football. If there's high school, if there's Pop Warner, you know, <laughs> you know, if that's on and there's nothing else on, I'll watch that over over a pro basketball or or you know, baseball game because that's how much of a part of my life it is. My dad played 14 years in the NFL. I'm second generation, and um, you know. We'll, we'll see if one of my younger ones, one of my boys, I got two boys, we'll see if one of them will play. But uh, I miss it. I miss when I got to go back and coach, be part of something, you know, be part of a team, something bigger than yourself. That's really the biggest aspect that everybody misses when they leave the game. But um, I think I'll get back to it when the kids get a little old and they don't want to hang out with dad. I'll probably go back, you know, as a coach or, or a scout or something. Yeah, because you were the linebackers coach in 15, right? 15 and 16, I was assistant linebacker yeah. coach. Yep. Yeah, assistant linebacker coach, yeah. Yeah, so you yep. think you go back to that once your kids get older? Yeah, I, I hope so. I would love to. It, you know, I had an absolute – who wouldn't have fun coaching Bobby and KJ? Yeah, seriously. 
And I mean, that whole room was talented. Um, but, you know, I, I, I felt that I couldn't, it was doing a disservice, not only to my kids at home, you know, missing time with them, but if I can't be fully immersed, you know, in the moment and, you know, helping them, I can't rob them of a couple of years of their prime, you know, to, to play this game. Like I said, I would play, if you, my whole career, it, it says seven years on the Wikipedia, but it was five years and five games, man. It, it goes by like that. And you look up now and KJ and Bobby are already 10 years in, 10 and nine, you know, so it's, um, it's incredible um, how quickly it goes. And so, you know, there was, there's no time to, to, to mess around because, you know, that's, we, that's, that's the one thing we don't have, you know, unlimited amount of this time and everybody's is precious. And so I didn't want to rob them or my, uh, my family of, of, you know, of time. Yeah. It must be hard not, you know, being on the road when your family's home, you have babies. It's just, uh, you know, it's really the, you're not on the road too much, you know, um, it's, but it's, it's demanding in terms of hours, you know, you're in there pretty early five or so. And then, you know, you got a game plan for the next day, which can have you there till 10, 11 nights sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That must be hard. No. Yeah. I don't play. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, do you hope your sons will follow in the footsteps of you and their, and their grandpa and play football? I just want them to be happy. So it, you have to have as dangerous as football is. And I know firsthand from all the injuries, um, you know, you have to have a passion for this game. You know, you can't just like football. You got to love football, you know, and um, even, even at the high school level, you got to love football to go through what we go through and uh, to, you know, go out there because otherwise you're going to get someone hurt. You need yourself hurt or you could get somebody else hurt, you know, one of your teammates. So, um, that's my biggest thing. Whatever they're most passionate about, that's that's the direction I'm going to steer. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. Um, what was the difference in Mike Holmgren's coaching style and Pete Carroll? I, I mean, I'd say pretty much polar opposites, <laughs> you know, which is very cool because they've both been wildly successful in the NFL. Um, it, it just proves the point. You don't have to be one way or the other, just got to be yourself. Now, Mike is a very, you know, stern, I don't want to say disciplinarian. I know that comes off a lot, you know, you know, he'll, he'll yell a couple of times. I mean, you see it on the TV. So, but, um, you know, he really is a giant teddy bear. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not joking. He's, he's like a father figure. He cares about you. Um, but, you know, he is serious about being the best at his craft. And that's why, you know, that's what he expected out of his, his men. And the same for Pete, but Pete um, would say like, it's, it's more of like a, a, a best friend, you know? So where you go from like a father, it's to like the cool uncle, I'll say, <laughs> you know, um, the father's brother, the cool uncle that just, you know, you want to hang out with and everything, but um, you know, you, they both, their styles. I mean, like Mike's, I'd say, he expected, you know, precision in terms of like, yo, if the split's three yards, you better be three yards, you know, like um, no, no penalties, do not, good teams don't beat themselves. And, and with Pete, it's, it's really more about energy and, you know, which is contagious, whether it's good energy or bad energy, it's contagious. So being the life force and, you know, really just, you know, making your presence felt on the field. And, um, and you see it, they're both, they both have very effective uh, coaching styles, but, um, but yeah, polar opposites. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, everyone I've asked, they say he cares. It's a very player friendly team. And then Mike Holmgren was very like a lot more business. Like. It, absolutely. He was, you know, maybe a little more old school and um, you know, uh, they were both very demanding though. So like, that's, you know, even though Pete's, he, you know, he might come off as, you know, rah, rah, like they like to say, he demands excellence, just like, just like Holmgren does. It's just the way you go about it. And um, that's their personalities. And I think that's the biggest thing when coaches, they get into trouble there, they're not being true to themselves and who they are, you know, they, you know, because, you know, guys can tell when, when, you know, you're lying or they can read through some, some, some BS. So just be yourself. And uh, because they, every, they both know a lot of football. Now they just got to like 
get the guys to buy in and trust the process. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this is my last question. What does our current team need to do to go from playoff team to Super Bowl contender? Ooh, man. That, that's a question for somebody much smarter than me. Um, I, there's just a couple, I think, details. You know, personnel-wise, I think we're not far off. I think uh, maybe a couple, a couple of linemen uh, because our old line is getting a little older on, on the left side with Yupati and uh, Brown. And it's, I mean, if they want to play, then continue to play because they're, they're both studs, but they're getting up there in age and you just have to groom people to replace it because those are two, I mean, that, that left tackle, especially like where Dwayne plays, that's, that's such a challenging position to play, man. That's where, you know, you get the other team's best rusher. Um, you know, the blind side. And then on defense, if we can get a couple more Dean, like a true pass rusher um, and, and maybe, I mean, I think we're pretty stout in the middle with, you know, Reed, Ford, uh, Mone, you know, so I'd like to see KJ come back. I mean, I'm a little biased because I like linebackers and I mean, you know, we got, we got the two best linebackers, you know, I think in the league, but also, you know, in the, in the history of the organization, in my opinion, and so I want to keep him and Bobby together for, for another year or two. And um, we'll see what happens with, with Shaq and Chris Carson. Those are the two guys I think they're going to be tough to sign back because they're so valuable. Um, much like KJ, it's going to be tough to sign him back because a lot of the coaches that have coached here, um, they're Sal is a head coach in New York. Gus Bradley's a D coordinator. Dan Quinn's a D coordinator. Um, and I think there's one more out there. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris, Rickard, Chris Richard. I don't know if Rashard is. I know he was interviewing with uh, the Raiders, but I think, yeah, that went to Gus. But there, there's just a lot of guys out there that know the value of a KJ Wright, and they need to change their culture. And in order to do that, you got to go get a cornerstone, you know? And so that's why I think, you know, even, even Sherm, he's going to be, hopefully we get a reunion with Sherm, right, for a year or two, because I couldn't stand seeing him in a 49er jersey. That was tough. Uh, man, it's terrible. Uh, so hopefully he comes back. Sharma, if you're listening, come back. But, um, you know, just those those couple pieces. And, and I think, you know, I mean, we finished 12 and four. Um, we wanted to be playing our best at the end of the season. And it was the tail of two halves. The first half defense was really struggling because of injuries. And then the second half offense was, was struggling. So we'll see, you know, that's when you want to play. Look at Tampa. Like they, they, they limped into the playoffs really. Like, I mean, they won their last five or six of the regular season, but they had to win all of those to get in there. And, um, and then they, they finished it all on the road to, to, to finish the last one at home, you know, obviously, but um, you know, that's whoever gets hot towards the end of the season wins it. So I don't think we're far off. Uh, maybe just a couple of pieces on that O and D line. Yeah. I want to um, say something. What you said, um, Clint Hurd's a defensive line coach. He's crazy at developing defensive tackle. You see Puna Ford, Brian Monet, and Jaron Reed. It's crazy. Like that's a hard position to get find good players at. And he has three ones that he's made great. Yeah, and I'm excited about you know we Taylor, the kid from Tennessee that we didn't get to see because he was injured. Uh, Rasheem came back and he helped out. Dunlap was. Yeah. I mean you know, John Schneider strikes again, getting trade deadline, and he hooks us up with one of the, you know, best interior pass rushers in the league. The guy's got almost 90 sacks. So I think we have him for one more year. And then, um, you know, it, but I, I like both of our safeties are incredible, um, you know, Diggs and Adams. So, and, and it's, that's the thing is, you know, when, when they were taking a lot of criticism early on, you can take the best players, you know, like look at the Pro Bowl. Like if you take – a Pro Bowl squad and plug them in, they're going to take a while to develop that, that chemistry of how, who's taking the over route. Yo, when are you coming off and taking the deep third? And when am I coming down to jump it? You know, you can put it on paper all you want, but until they actually get time, you know, in rhythm together, it's, um, it was going to look like it did in, in the first half of things. But as the pass rush came, came to life, um, you know, we were jumping routes. Reed was incredible. I mean, that's there's there's John, that. there's John doing his thing again, man. This is a guy that, you know, on the practice squad of the Niners, and um, we we turned him into a starter. And I mean, kid's been awesome. So 
I'm excited to see his growth in having a, a full year uh, under his belt. And um, the sky's the limit for this team. We still, I mean, Russ and Bobby, they're only in year nine, year 10. Like, you know, and they both look great physically. They they haven't had major injuries, knock on wood. Like, I, they still got a five-year window of, you know, they can, they can take advantage of. Yeah, I saw the stuff today, though, with Russ being frustrated with the offensive line. So I think we definitely have to put some money into top offensive linemen. See, and this is the year. How old are you? I am 14. All right. So you're very early in your in your uh, media uh, career, right? You know, I, I hope you go on. I see you on TV. But did you see the interview? Did you get the, the actual Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After he said, um, what I'd love to say with Seattle, that's my career. That, that's not what I'm afraid of. I'm no. afraid of that, though. I know, but. So I turn on the TV because I, I watched I watched the, the interview and the first thing he said was I could get the ball out a little faster. I need to get that ball. And it's like everybody just cut that part of the clip out and they went with, yeah, getting sacked 394 times is too much. So it's like so when I better not see any of this edited to, to, to you know, yeah. make, it, make it something I didn't say. <laughs> yeah, because there was the, the quote they they put it out as um. I don't know if I'm available at the Seahawks thing, but right after that, he said, um, but I, I'd love to be in Seattle for my career, but they, they didn't put that part in. I, yeah, exactly. Right. I, they just, they're just, they just throwing it up for no reason. Yeah. They, they twist their words. To get a happy home. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, know. It's terrible. They're just trying to break up a happy home, man. Don't let them do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we definitely have to sign a, um, a, like, um, Joe Tooney or Brandon Sheriff from, but I mean, those, those are going to be expensive guys, but I think it's definitely needed. And then draft someone. They are, they are, but I mean, you know, I, I look back at, you know, when, when we, you know, we had the number one offense in the, you know, in the league in 2005 and maybe even, I think they were in the top three in 2003 and four before I got there, that old line, man, that was like three or four first round picks, um, you know, yeah, Walt Jones, Steve Hutchinson, two Hall of Famers, uh, Robbie Tobeck, Chris Gray, Sean Locklear, another second or third round pick. Uh, maybe maybe he's a fourth, but I mean, those are some those are some great players. And then uh, defensive line was great. I, I love that defensive line that I had. Um, and then when you look at the Super Bowl run that John and Pete had, they were deep on both sides, offense and defensive line. You know, so uh, Okung Unger, um, you know. Sweezy, Breno Giacomini, who he never gets enough credit for. He's a Jersey guy. Oh, he's a Boston guy, but I think, did he go to school in Jersey? I think so. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, you know, the game's won in the trenches, you know, as much as it hurts me to say that as a linebacker, I mean, you know, the, the O and D line, that's where it's at. Yeah, you look at the top four teams that were in the NFC and AFC championship, Chiefs, Bucks, Bills, and Packers, they were all spending like over $30 million in their offensive line. You know, a top offensive line in the league. You can't go far without that offensive line. You can't, man. I, I'm telling you, it's it's tough sledding for any running back or linebacker if they don't have the dogs up front. So, yeah, man. Yeah. All right. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and talking. Yeah, brother. We'll do this again in the future. Congrats. And, and see, look. By by jumping on Zoom, I got you out of your comfort zone, and you and you got better today. How about that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I wish you well, man. Um, love what you you and all all you guys are doing uh, with the, with those pages, man. Keep it up, and um, you know, stay blessed. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. All right.